So our mission at Big Success is to help good people have more money so that they can do more good. And today, we are going to bring you a very good news story. Now, here's the thing. You've seen this in Hollywood. You know, I mean, Hollywood has this movie called The Miracle on 34th Street. Yes. <laughs> and the Macy Santa Claus, if you happen to recall the movie, the Macy Santa Claus told this little boy that if he wanted a fire truck, his mom should go to a competitor. Well, you know, that sounds great in Hollywood, right? But that can't possibly work in the real world. But yet we have a guest on today who says differently. Welcome to the Big Success Show, J.J. Williams. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. It's like you're, you're like this movie because, uh, so, Kiona uh, Vineyards, is that right? Kiona, did I say it right, Kiona? You did, yeah. Kiona, you're, a lot of people say Washington Kiona. Yeah. You're the director of operations, and you've been telling people to go get their wine someplace else. What are you thinking? <laughs> Uh, you know, it's all about how um, the Washington wine industry um, works together. I think we've got a good camaraderie. Um, and the simple truth of the matter is that with retail sales being shut down effectively, um, a lot of the smaller wineries in the Pacific Northwest, their incomes have gone to zero. Because, you know, if you're making 1,000 to 2,000 to 3,000 cases of wine per year, your business model nine times out of 10 is to sell that wine out the door direct to consumer, right? So from a consumer's perspective, you're walking in the door, you're having a nice tasting, you're probably meeting the owner and the winemaker, the proprietor, and you're forming that relationship and then walking out hopefully with a nice case of wine. Mm -hmm. um, now with COVID and social distancing, th that they kick the legs out on that stool, so to speak. So there's a lot of good people in Washington that are running, you know, nice businesses um, that their incomes have gone down to zero mm. um, or close to zero, you know, with curbside or someone calling up and there being a delivery, that type of thing. Um, so, Kiona, we are in somewhat of a unique position here in Washington in that we are a winery that has been around for a long time. So, my grandfather started this operation along with my grandmother and their friends, um, and we planted our first vineyard in 1975. Mm. So, by Washington State standards, we've been around for a long time. <laughs> um, and you know, during that time, we've seen a, a, a fair number of, of events, <laughs> nothing quite like this. Yeah. Um, but you know, we've had controlled linear growth. We haven't been perhaps the, we're, we're somewhat risk averse in that we're okay with just small incremental improvement, small incremental um, increases in sales and profit and revenue and not necessarily taking the moonshot as it might be. Um, and, you know, now 40 years later, after doing that time and time and time again, we're at a spot where we're farming wine grapes for ourselves, obviously. Um, but we're also growing wine grapes for about 60 other producers. And the thing about our um, region, Red Mountain, is that it's the grapes are very high priced for Washington State. So the wineries, the business models, where it makes sense to spend a lot of money per ton on wine grapes are more often than not boutique wineries with you know the types of wines that get good accolades, good scores with magazines and with reviewers, and they're parlaying that into direct-to-consumer sales. Um, so at Kayana, we, we um, also have a tasting room. But unlike most family-run wineries, the tasting room is not our sole method of, um, you know, generating income. So obviously we're growing grapes. We're also, you know, fortunate to have a lot of good distributor partners um, throughout the country. So including um, here in Washington and in Illinois and, you know, 42 states actually. So we're all like, I was going to say, you're 42 states. 42 That's states. pretty incredible. Yeah. And, yeah. and how yeah. grocery stores? 
That's a good question. Um, when we sell the wine <laughs> to a distributor, they, um, they're, they're kind of the middleman. And then they go out and they sell wine to restaurants and grocery stores and retail shops and that type of thing. And we're not necessarily privy to that information. Um, but, you know, the simple answer is that we're available in retail outlets all over the country. Um, and that is somewhat rare for a smallish independently owned operation because oftentimes when you go into a grocery store, you know, the wines that you find there are made by big, big, big companies, right? So we, we're kind of in this, this strange spot where we're an independent uh, producer. We tell people we're a big little winery. So in more ways, in more ways than not, we function like a little winery but we've got a little uh, more juice in the tank than some of the real tiny guys. If you spell that big with two G's, JJ, we'd be really happy. <laughs> there you go. But, but, but I guess like to, to kind of just move this to, to where, what, what caught our attention was in your blog post, you said, hey, look, if you want to buy wine direct, don't buy from us, buy from one of our competitors, right? Yeah. So what, yeah. what, what, what's the thought process behind that? Why'd you do that? You're telling people to go spend money somewhere else. Most right. business people don't do that. Why'd you come right. up with that? Um, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, there, there's a lot of reasons. I don't know if there's one particular reason. Um, I think it's the simple fact of the matter is that we like a lot of our neighbors and mm -hmm. competitors. Um, and I would hate to see them close their doors after working so hard. Mm -hmm. um, because of something outside of their control. Um, something we say here in Washington is we have a lot of co-peditors. Um, mm -hmm. So we might be working against each other, um, you know, from one perspective, but ultimately, and this is especially true in our grape growing region, Red Mountain. It's a very small grape growing area. Um, and our ceiling is capped in terms of production. And what makes people interested about Red Mountain is quality. We're seen around the world now as being one of the world's uh, best places to grow Cabernet Sauvignon and things that blend into Cabernet Sauvignon. So if you take a step back beyond, um, you know, selling wine in any day or month or year, it's really important for people to view Red Mountain as a quality grape growing region. And there are a lot of cool wineries that are our neighbors and our friends that are doing really cool, interesting wines. And they're helping to propagate that idea that Red Mountain is a quality wine producing region. So I, I, you know, I, I think that a lot of our neighbors would agree with the sentiment that when it comes to Red Mountain, a rising tide floats all boats. It's in my best interest for the guy down the road to also be putting out a really good wine that is of interest to the greater wine drinking public. Yep. That has more appeal than my neighbor or competitor going out of business yeah. or putting out a product that might sour a consumer's opinion on Red Mountain as a region. I think it's a very next generation kind of thinking too that 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 you know and, and maybe it's maybe it's something we even have lost along the way. I think that you know, along the way it used to be when, when maybe we had more smaller businesses and more kind of community focus, businesses generally tried to help each other out to serve the community at large. And over time, maybe we've kind of lost a little bit of that and may, maybe we're getting it back. And JJ, you're one of the leaders of that movement. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Um, you know, I'm certainly not alone in Washington wine. Um, the largest winery in Washington is owned by an S&P 500 company, mm. Chateau St. Michel. And they have been uh, excellent stewards of the industry as a whole. You know, if they wanted to stomp some of us into the dirt, mm. they probably could have. <laughs> yeah. but, time and time, but time and time again, they've been collaborative and supportive of, you know, wineries that don't have big coffers. Um, and I guess, you know, following their lead, we're kind of doing this same thing. Do you have advice for, I mean, I, this would work for any, I mean, advice for anybody who is, whether they're in the wine business or any kind of business struggling right now to try and, you know, find a way to have e-commerce. Um, sure. Is there any advice that you would pass along uh, to folks? Yeah, um, I think that 
going into 2020 and beyond, this is the, um, the customization economy um, mm -hmm. and the personalization economy. So like customers want to know that you value them. Um, so looking at your customers as an ATM that walks in the door that must be rung for every dollar is, um, you know, effective in the short term, but maybe not so effective in the long term. Um, so we use that philosophy and mantra up and down our decision making process. In this case, you know, we're growing wine grapes for other wineries. Um, it also means, you know, when we have a Kiona member and they do decide to order online or call us up and they want to have a box of wine sent to them in the quarantine, like that is by every definition a luxury spend, right? Like mm -hmm. they don't have to spend their money right now right. on wine. Um, so, you know, like I run this company more or less, but I fill the boxes and I put a note in there. I write on each one that says, hey, you know, Lisa, thanks for your mm -hmm. order. You know, thanks, Ken. Thanks for your order, whoever awesome. it may be. Um, and my handwriting's not super good, but hopefully <laughs> the sentiment, uh, you know, translates. Yes. Yeah, and just, you know, it doesn't have to take very long. But, you know, Amazon is great because you order something and it shows up in a box two days later, but you don't know, like, that's kind of an amorphous process. Like, you mm -hmm. know that someone behind the curtain pulled a lever and you got your book. Yeah. Um, but there's a real opportunity, even through an e-commerce channel, to, to generate a touch point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we're supposed to be touchless. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there you go. Maybe the wrong uh yes. the wrong word. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you got it exactly right, JJ. So so you know, I think there are a lot of people out there who, you know, some people dream of owning a restaurant, some people dream of all kinds of things, but one of the thing I think one of the things I think a lot of people dream is about owning a winery. Would you have any suggestions for mm -hmm. Now I got a friend in the restaurant business, I got to tell you. He he says you want to retire a millionaire in the restaurant business, he says, start with $2 million. I don't there know if winery is like that or not. but uh, <laughs> We have but, a similar phrase, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But would you have any for somebody, I mean, I guess I, I, I'm completely ignorant on how to, how to get involved in the wine business, but like, is it something you would start, you would buy? What, what would you suggest? That's a good question. Um, the important thing when you're starting a winery is to have patience. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you're also farming mm. between deciding that you're going to plant a vineyard um, and having a finished sellable product in your hand, that being a bottle of wine, realistically, you're looking at a decade. Wow. Um, yeah. That's so most people don't have that kind of time mm -hmm. or money, you know, mm -hmm. ca huge capital expenditures up front to hopefully get paid, you know, mm -hmm. 10 years down the line. Um, so it's important to scale, um, have a, a, there's lots of custom winemaking facilities where, you know, even here in Washington, you can um, pick the brain of someone who's been doing it a long time. You can rent their facility. You know, if you want to start a winery, you're sourcing good fruit, and then you're leaning on the expertise of people who have been doing it for a long time. And you can come to market, you know, fairly quick and without having to buy and build a facility. Mm. Um, so, yeah, and that, you know, that type of camaraderie and leaning on the community is kind of built into that business model. Interesting. Uh, Charlie, Charlie Hoppus, um, who runs a winery right down the road, he has another business where he, he's called the Wine Boss. And so he's got a facility, a winemaking facility, and he's helping, I don't know, dozens of mm -hmm. other Washington wineries, you know, get their products to market. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Well, we, we always say that entrepreneurs are really good at adding value in the lives of other people, and by doing so, they create value in their own lives. JJ, you're an example of that. You know, you're, you're actually looking out for your competition that's adding value to both your customers and to the competition and ultimately creates value for you. So that's why we wanted to talk with you. 
Thank Nothing you. Nothing success. Me. That's right. <laughs> I appreciate and that. Also, so thank you for sharing your good news story with us. And then we also want to give a shout out to John Rector, <laughs> who is also your cousin, who told us about you because you've been making headlines with, uh, you know, your your good news and the way that you're treating other businesses and looking out for other people. <laughs> so that's how we got connected. So we want to thank John for that. Yeah, thanks, John, for connecting those dots. Appreciate that. Facebook is <laughs> And we thank you for listening and watching today. Uh, JJ, your website is? KionaWine.com. But don't go there. <laughs> no, do go there. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> it's all good, so. <laughs> all right, thanks, JJ. Thanks, guys, I appreciate it. And until next time, here's to your, your big, big success. success.